uh, Zayed. Uh, his presentation will look at uh, who, what, why, where, and how uh, his representation of landscape photography portraying our twin island state. Um, though he's ventured to several beautiful places around the globe, uh, he's also felt that uh, we too have work as scenery worthy of being shown off right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, hence his dedication to landscapes, seascapes, and the Caribbean scenics. Um, he's also started a project uh, on Instagram called I Love Trinidad and Tobago that portrays a lot of the uh, beautiful imagery of Trinidad and Tobago landscapes and seascapes. Um, and he plans tonight to show uh, his approach to how he visualizes these scenes and how he translates that into an image uh, which asks, which begs out the use of what uh, is that turn up, is that in turn on today? So without further ado, Zach, you have, you have the floor. Woo! Yeah. All right, good night everyone. Um, first I want to apologize for being late. Um, it's unforeseen, unavoidable, but I'll try to be as explicit as possible in my presentation. To be honest, um, I think this could have I could have gone several different ways. I didn't really want it to be about like my work and what I have done or what I have accomplished per se, but maybe to see if there are some salient points that parties interested in doing such types of photography might be able to take away and apply in their own visual and, and imaginative process to, to, to sort of create, you know, what what would it be whatever genre of photography they're interested in, but I just kind of take, you know, some you know, the, the extension nonsense, so to speak. Right, so, um, essentially, um, I like to do uh, landscape photography for various, the, you know, nine to five photographer, and utmost respect to those who do apply the trade in that fashion, especially in this genre of photography. Um, the reason why I mention that is that because we have to share our time in between earning a living and being able to do what we like. So I have a little saying that I do what I have to do to be able to do what I like to do. For, so this guy was basically like, you know, showing off, look at this beautiful image I captured of some scenery somewhere in Brazil. And another local photographer said, well, you know, you can only photograph what you see. And um, I think that's a very important point because, you know, they can be found in mundane things or just the everyday thing, whether you travel abroad or you're at home, there's an opportunity to capture beautiful scenery. And um, because of what I have seen or been around, that has kind of shaped my creative uh, perspective in terms of what I like to do. So essentially, I first picked up a camera in 2008, your basic starter scenario. I didn't know what it was in terms of what it could have been. I just knew I liked taking photographs and I was around nice scenery. Um, so it was surely I realized after a year or so that I far outgrew the camera I started with and I then went the proverbial this way of getting a DSLR, your know, standard little crop sensor and stuff. And uh, I used that for a short period of time before I um, caught the bug to upgrade. And again, I mentioned this because also too, equipment is a very common discussion among photographers, but it's probably the most irrelevant. And I feel that you can create amazing imagery um, with a phone or with whatever you have. My friend has a very good saying, the best camera is the one that you have at the point in time. So, um, but me personally, I knew I had a specific uh, goal because in 2010, I was chatting with a friend of mine and I found that I wanted to maybe embark on a project where I could showcase scenery of Trinidad and Tobago because at the point in time, well, that's before Instagram and social media and the various platforms for sharing. You know, I think back then it was Flickr, you know what you think, yeah? So, I, you know, I was a little Flickr addict myself, sharing terrible imagery, and I <laughs> could have sworn it was the greatest thing on it. Um, so, I decided, you know, I would, uh, you know, register my little domain and stuff and get my ideas formulated where I could just showcase imagery of Trian Tobago. However, I thought that I was not ready for it and because of that, I kind of sat on that for maybe six years before I actually started to act on my idea. So that's why I said I should have started sooner because at the end of the day, I realize now that you will never be ready and you can always look back at your images and you know, be your own criti critic and realize that they, they just weren't good enough. And I think, well, I will touch on that also at the end in terms of I think that was one of the biggest parts of being able to improve and be, you know, get to that space that you would like to be in creatively. Um, 
So why landscape photography? Well, again, as I mentioned, that's what I encountered in my day-to-day -day, you know, environment. Um, it's personal enjoyment for me. It's like solitude. It's, uh, it's like my drug, so to speak. So like I, for want of a better word, I want to hide if I'm in nice scenery and I you know, get that sense of gratification, being able to capture it. You know, you're one with nature. And um, especially if you, you know, depending on what you like, you like the outdoors, you know, you like the natural environment, or you have appreciation for maybe architecture or the built environment or human endeavor and achievement, then you can be able to capture certain things and it gives you satisfaction to be able to portray it in the way that you probably visualized. Um, passion is one of the underlying things in it all because I guess just like any hobby or anything that you you know, put your time into, you want to make it worth your while. And um, for me, it developed very quickly into that. So um, one other aspect is that because of how I work and where I work, a lot of my work involves uh, the coastal zone. So I see the coastal environment and, you know, we talk about climate change and these things, and these things are very real. And I have seen firsthand our environment changes before our eyes, and sometimes we don't appreciate it. It could even be the natural environment, how it processes such as wind waves, tides, erosion, uh, sea level rise, whatever have you, storms, change things. Or it could be a uh, human endeavor, how things change and history uh, develops over time from you know being able to encounter abandoned train tracks and be fascinated by that versus now you know you 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 know I guess what we see nowadays in public transport, you know, you probably wouldn't have an appreciation for those things, you know, and I guess we have on a, a repository, you know, images over the years that we can go back to. Today, in looking through my presentation material, I found an image of an old Carney Tasker. And like kids nowadays would not even know what that is. They wouldn't see these things. So I think we're like online, we're we are, we are, we are documentary, you know, we document time, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> so at the end of the day, my fundamental goal is to portray uh, whatever location I am at, or I would like to, 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 to photograph in a better way than I have seen it. And some might criticize that um, because, okay, is it like a false impression or false representation of the site? Um, I wouldn't say so. It's my creative take on a particular location. And I like the viewer to feel a sense of wonder and a sense of um, let the imagination run wild. You know, where is this? Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful, I like to go here. And I do get that satisfaction when people make those comments. Um, again, nothing to do with ego, but the fact that they can look at it and, and I think my intention was able to be uh, manifested into my image and that people will really wonder, that's, that's not card B, you, you gotta be kidding me. Or, well, there's always littered and dirty and whatnot. Well, my, my re remark to that is, well, maybe it will encourage us to take better care of our environment and maybe realize what it could be. Um, I'm not saying that I, you know, um, create a false image, but sometimes I might purposely try to remove some things because I think there may be a distraction. And I think they would not, they would not be able to let the viewer's eyes focus on what is, what is my subject matter, you know? Um, that being said too, it is a frustrating exercise too because sometimes you go to many locations and it's, you know, just, just we take very poor care of our environment. I went to La Brea the other day to try to treat some landscapes there and it's probably the nastiest beach I've ever been to. And I, I, I could not capture it because what I wanted to portray was impossible without me totally altering the image beyond recognition. And I want to ensure at least there is some truth in, in what I present with an artistic twist. I could not do that. So I abandoned that location. It was terrible. That's by the station, by, by Karachem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another point that I'd like to maybe touch on is um, you know the fact that I saw a guy by the waterfront the other day. I saw him with his camera gear and stuff. You know, you see a fellow photographer. I'm a kind of bit of a loner. So when I see other photographers outside in the field, you know, it's kind of interesting. Hey, what you doing? You know, um, hey, yeah, you know, I come to do a shoot, a graduation shoot. The, some, the, the, the person I came to photograph, the late and all this stuff, I had a little bit of a laugh inside because I don't have those problems. <laughs> but it's a real, it's a real problem because I have other friends who do portrait photography. But each genre has its pros and cons. And the guy asked me what I was doing. I said, well, no, I'm a landscape photographer, no worries, man, enjoy. He laughed and said, boy, you can't make a living, you can't earn no money doing that. I said, well, that you know is true to an extent. However, that is, um, I think, a bit of a misconception also, because, for example, if you're a plumber, you wouldn't quit your day job to do plumbing if you didn't know how to do plumbing. So I think you have to perfect your craft 
to an extent that you can become proficient at it and thereby people will be willing to part with their cash in whatever way to, to, to be able to have you um, pay for your work. As a landscape photographer, the, you know, the, that, that, that nice building, that ancient um, St. Saint, Saint Charles Macroup, right? That you can't, they can't pay you for that, but I guess because um, it's an inanimate object, but you know, you're, you can't earn a living by potentially, or you can supplement your living, your, 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 your expenses as a photographer by selling prints. You can um, be able to have your images published in magazines and various uh, publications that you know, uh, are circulated locally, regionally, and internationally. Um, there are various opportunities and ways you can earn a dollar and for me, that, that's another little bit of satisfaction that I could probably earn a bit of money here and there to reinvest in my photography and keep my hobby going and keep my wife off my back. <laughs> because it's an expensive pastime and when you start to work pastime, you have to justify these things. So when I want to buy a lens for $2,000, my wife will look at me like, what on earth are you thinking? You don't, just don't earn no money. And I will say, well, babe, I sold six prints last month. So, yeah. Um, I put this here because um, it sort of emphasizes my, one of my comments before. I was at sea a few weeks ago and a friend so sent me this article in a photograph on WhatsApp and I was like, what well, I knew, all my image ended up in the paper. I was kind of happy and a little bit confused because no one told me anything about it. There's an image I recently shared on social media. They were actually kind enough not to Photoshop or remove my watermark, though you probably can't even discern who the hell this is, it's a little signature there. They managed to spell my name incorrectly, but that's irrelevant. Um, the point is, the image was um, put there because the Cali Bay community, fishing community, found that they would like to um, capitalize on maybe the potential of the location for ecotourism, as it says here. And if you read in the fine print there, they, you know, they look at the opportunity to relocate some of the fishermen. They're going to backfill the jetty, um, give the fishermen a certain space, and sort of you know, do a beautification project on the beach. If it actually happens, great. Um, actually, they are working on it because the jetty is being backfilled as we, as we speak, and um, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, uh, so what that said to me is that actually my end goal is, is actually somewhat a, a realistic one because someone saw this somewhere and decided to use that as inspiration and, you know, again, what could be? You know, look at it and they say, well, hey, we could probably market Cali Bay or it's probably a good, you know, spot and people could get some pride and you know, it is beautiful, and I think if maybe, I would, is it bold to say if I didn't share this, they may not have realized that? I don't know, but it sort of emphasizes what I mentioned and why I do what I do, and again, the intangible effects of it, because you can inspire others. You know, the, the average Trinidadian, your fellow man, so on and so forth. Um, who? So, Okay, I mentioned I'm a loner, so to speak, when I go and do my photography, but I have encountered wonderful peers who are like-minded. So, for example, folk like Nisha, and I have two good colleagues who I regularly shoot landscapes with. And the reason why I am mentioning who is probably, maybe you think it might be relevant, but I would like to touch on this because I was in a little bit of shambles for the last two weeks, oh, sorry, for the last two days because I went Monday with some friends to shoot landscapes in a remote location, and um, it could have ended very badly for us. And I'm here presenting to you about landscape photography, and I'm talking about a bad experience because it's reality. We live in a climate where things are not uh, the most rosy, and I think maybe more reason why to do what we are doing to maybe you know have a change of mindset in the John public, but. We were at a spot where um, we didn't even realize that we were encroaching in someone's personal space. And you know, it goes to show sometimes you're in the element. And if you're really, sometimes you could be in a trance and you have a beautiful sunset, amazing scenery, you're lining up a perfect composition and it's like drugs, serious. And you don't have any idea what's going on around you. And um, basically a guy approached um, myself and two colleagues, wanting to know what's going on here. In a nutshell, we were shot at. What? No joke. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Yeah. So that had me a bit um, disoriented for the last two days. Man um, went for a gun and literally uh, ran us off away from where we were. And I, I, I don't say we were shot at, we, there was a gunshot fire, it was in the air to scare us off, but we were literally run into the hills, uh, camera gear on the ground, um, a guy lost some equipment, and 
Yeah, so I mentioned this because we need to be mindful of where we are and what we do and you know, we carry expensive equipment, we have our lives at stake. Again, and this is not um, the best context to paint, but it's reality. So it is important for us to get together and do, you know, the strength in numbers and we need to go out there and we need to be, be safe in what we do and to be honest, some locations now aren't what they were many years ago. Um, however, again, Hopefully, yeah, that the, the right people see things and understand what we're doing and they are receptive to, you know, their craft, so to speak, and they appreciate it. Maybe that incident was a one-off. I would like to chalk it up to that. As my friends say, pictures had to take. And we will still go and take pictures. We're just not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a real, it's, it's a true story. It's not, yeah, I was kind of pondering even saying it because I don't want to be a do Debbie Downer, but it is reality. Um, but we're all good and We'll do some more imagery this week. Um, focus groups, peers, get together, you know, there are workshops. Um, Christy would have been talking about the TTPS initiatives. So all of these things are even now even more important so you can get together in a safe way and go and do what we love and you know come, come home to all of ones. Um, another reason why I would like to mention who is that you know we can inspire one another. You know, like since I started recently sharing more of my work. I realize I have grown and developed more in the last three years or so than I have in the previous six or seven or how much ever since I first picked up a camera. And that's because I think that it's easy to um, stay in a comfort zone, but I think if you really start to look outside of the comfort zone and push your limits or your boundaries of, of what you're doing, learning new things, you know, um, being able to share information with other photographers, being able to look at others' work and be able to admit when your work is not up to standard and be able to aspire to a particular goal. And this is, I think, all types of photography, you know, landscape photography alone. And um, that's one thing that I realize has helped me and I think it's good to sometimes remove ego and sort of like, you know, because I think ego is a big problem in terms of photography on the whole. It's easy to be um, filled with pride in your own work, but, you know, at the end of the day, you can always see someone's work that's way better than yours and it's good to understand that and see what about you can take away and improve your own work. So I am not where I would like to be in my in photography at all. I am nowhere near and I would like to be even better and because I, I, the only way to achieve that is to surround yourself with like-minded individuals and be able to look at others' work and improve. So um, what is the island scene for me? Please excuse the the images seem to be a little saturated in the transition from the PC to the um, projector, but um, just forgive that little thing there. Um, again, going back to what I mentioned, I want to be able to show or be able to depict imagery that seems to be out, you know, of the in, in a perfect world, so to speak, or something that captures the essence of the Caribbean scene. We live in a, 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 an environment surrounded by the coasts. We have nice warm weather, we have sunshine, we have all these wonderful traditional uh, subject matter, the coconut trees, the boats, you know, the, the person staying by the seashore, this kind of thing. So at the end of the day, um, the subject matter and the locations and all of these different things can come together for you know, what I think is a perfect island scene. And, I mention island scene because at the end of the day, it's easy to look at all these beautiful photographs from photographers all over the globe with big majestic mountains and you could go all, you know, you could get all caught up in wanting to go Patagonia and Iceland and all these majestic waterfalls and big scene. But you know, I look, I look at it from their shoes also, eh? you know, you don't think they're sitting down and saying, wait, I'd like to go to the Caribbean and take in a little pigeon point scenery and you know, be able to capture those sorts of things because it's foreign to them. And we take it for granted because this is everyday scenery for us. So it's easy for us to look, you know, afar and, 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 and you know, the grass always seems green on the other side, but you have beautiful scenery at home. And that's one reason why I think I, am, I have enough to keep me busy from a photography perspective, even if I focus on small little children and the Babel because there's so much to photograph. So, you know, there's a natural environment, there's a built environment, and there are, you know, even the Caribbean person in there their, their environment on the whole is, is another nice uh, subject matter that I like to be able to focus on. Um, so many different locations, as I mentioned. You have waterfalls, forests, mountains, the coastal environment, the natural environment, 
the, the green spaces and savannas and also in the um, you can have answer, the in, in terms of natural scenery and in terms of sorry the, the island landscape opportunity you have all these cultural celebrations that you know sometimes are able to be you know I think you guys went the other day and photographed a, 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 a um, Gangana. Gangana. Gangana right. right so you know like for me I wish I could have gone because I would have, would not have only focused on the persons doing their their festivities their um, rituals and whatnot but the entire scene itself is one that you know warrants uh, you know could could make a good island seascape and whatnot and a good uh, scene um, I mentioned the Caribbean man and the old woman in their environment one of my you know most uh, fond experiences being able to go to these coastal villages and be able to experience the fishermen doing their thing you know this guy was coming in from a day of fishing and it is a very special image for me because it's one of my first good seascapes I would say this is about four years old I shot this and um, I really sort of visualized this scene to be honest and I went back repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly until I got everything that I wanted in terms of the, the composition elements, the lighting, the color, the, the whole, the whole, the whole scene how it unfolded, unfolded before my eyes with all the various boats around, and this guy basically just, you know, plowing his way home with his rod because it's too shallow. Um, to me, it translates me to maybe something like somewhere in Bali or Indonesia or Malaysia or something like that. But we have scenes like that right here, home in Trinidad. Um, again, another example of the people watching and, and, and capturing the essence of the island vibe in the mundane fishing village. And you know, these two gentlemen exchanging afternoon words as they probably days, the days probably come to a close. Um, you know, we have everything coming together here with beautiful light. You have the environmental, you know, the, the specific subject matter like the parag on the shore. You have the boats. You know, I remember Nisha made a post the earlier about this little boat here. She photographed that boat for the last 10 years. You know, it's still there, just, you know, waiting to be captured. And, you know, there's so many different ways you can go to the same scene and capture things different each and every time. You know, I've seen so many images from this very spot that, you know, you, you recognize it because of what you see in it, but, you know, it's just different takes on it. Again, I visualize what I wanted and I try to put it together by seeing, you know, the different elements around me and this actually was shot on the same day that that other image I previously had was shot so what question it, where is that if you don't mind orange orange um orange valley fishing community orange orange field or the yeah, orange valley it's really yeah. correct too yeah so basically central Trinidad of the Waterloo main road is yeah. a promontory that sticks out at sea many photos birds you know oh, so. Tide, so many different things you could photograph there and to be honest, it's one of my favorite places to go. Um, again, you know, the island seascape for me is, again, drugs. I literally um, would fantasize over this image or what I conceptualize in my mind of what I wanted to capture. And actually, I made a trip to Tobago just for this because I spent numerous days coming here. This was my third attempt to get the image that I wanted. And um, it is basically something that I have tried to uh, recreate the afterwards. I just never really, that time was just perfect for me. So again, it may not be the perfect image, but for me, the important thing is to sort of visualize what you would like to portray and how it can come together for you. And that is what I try to employ here. But again, another example of the island seascape for me, from my, from my point of view. So, there are various times that landscape photographers can go out and you know capture images and whatnot, and it's worth worthy to be it's worthy of mention because you get different uh, end results. And like I mentioned, you can go to Orange Valley fishing community at different times of day and get a totally different feeling. So, for example, you know we all know about sunset and sunrise, and some men wife asks me why are the images are at sunset? Why are the images at sunrise? Well, to me, it's the most beautiful. You get the you know, it's the, the best light for me, uh, it's the, you get the color, and I guess slowly as I progressed over time, it's not only about the sky and the pretty sunset, but now most of the subject matter and how, you know, the, the, the sunset scenery adds just maybe just an extra touch to it. So I guess over time to my images, I look back at them, they have 
been uh, uh, adjusted, so to speak, in terms of focusing away from the sky alone as the main subject, to now maybe focusing more on compositional elements and being able to, you know, the, the sky is not the focal point anymore, but just a, a bonus. Um, golden hour, now to me is probably, you know, it's creeping in to be my favorite, and that's that hour before sunset or after sunrise, where you get that, you know, it's, it's nice strong golden light, but it's, you know, low on the horizon, long shadows, you can do so much creative opportunities with that, playing with shadows and that light, you know, it's, it gives beautiful tone to images, I guess portrait photographers sort of, uh, you know, seek that out also when they're doing their work. Um, being able to understand the differences of the periods of time after the sun has set, um, you can advance that, is uh, the different types of twilight, and you have civil twilight, nautical twilight, astronomical twilight, and night. I'll not go into this too much, you can do your own, um, you know, this is not gospel here, it's just maybe things to prompt you in trends of thought. Because you can go to one location, for example, and capture a totally different feel, and you might be able to ascertain when is the best time to photograph a particular subject. So the different twilight periods give different things, you know, for example, you'll get light on the horizon, and you may be able to see some stars if it's twilight, nautical twilight. And if it's a civil twilight, you still get that tinge of color in the sky, you know, so there are various um, benefits to be had by photographing at these different periods of time. So for example, at night time, you know, we all love a good astrophotography session when the weather condition behaves itself and cooperates. Um, again, you need optimum conditions for this, but you as a landscape photographer need to understand what these conditions are to be able to achieve, you know, the, 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 the environment to capture your um, subject matter. This is actually a stitch of about nine photographs to capture the Milky Way core over Celebia. So this was a shot earlier on this year, myself and a colleague ventured over to Celebia. Uh, it is littered with some uh, like pollution from the offshore infrastructure, far sea, and it's amazing to know how at night these things, you know, and your camera's technology can pick up these little, um, traces of light that the human eye would not pick up, you know. Um, you get plain tracks and trails through your images, shooting stars, clouds streaming through your astrophotography. Um, there's so much that goes on there and I have utmost respect for those that seek the perfect astro image. I like astrophotography but also it's very time consuming and laborious and you can make a three hour drive and get nothing like has happened to me a few times after this mission. So I think I pack up shop for astrophotography. <laughs> yeah, because to take a three hour drive to Toko is ridiculous. Again, another example of a different type of twilight. Uh, this, this, the sun has set here already, and this is civil twilight, so you do get that color on the horizon, like I mentioned, and you know, you do get darker shades of in, this, in the night, in the evening sky. Um, light is a lot more balanced and even, and, and the, the, you know, you can do different things uh, with your with your subject matter. This was shot in Brickfield, another favorite for landscape photographers. You know, you tend to see that a lot of the landscape photographers around like to go to these coastal fishing villages because they just offer so much, you know, in terms of different types of scenery. Um, so, at the end of the day, um, one of the big things are, are how, you know, and at the end of the day, my three main watchwords are um, composition, light, and color. So, um, a friend of mine asked me, you know, why am I not getting likes on Instagram? Why am I not getting engagement and all this stuff? You know, what hashtags do you use? It's like, you know, it's not about likes and hashtags and all these things. You know, the fundamentals of your photography are important, and that's what you need to focus on. Those things are just by the way. You know, likes matter, not, don't, don't mean a damn thing, to be honest. Um, you know, you can have one person like your image, and that person may be the one that may be willing to part with some cash for a print, for example, as opposed to having thousands of likes and just people giving you charity likes. You know, you can't go to the BNH with likes to buy some new gear. You know, <laughs> so you have to be able to perfect your craft again, like I mentioned earlier on. And again, it's a constant journey for me too. I'm nowhere near where I would like to be, but I, 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 as I go along, I understand more and more. You know, of of about the key elements and I've broken these down over time now as um, I focus on those three things. So compositions, it, this is not a lesson in composition. You can, there's so much information online with that and you can, you know, different types of things such as leading lines. Uh, I like to particularly seek out textured foregrounds, uh, repetition in patterns, 
uh, again, uh, rules of thirds, and basically I mentioned that because knowing the rules are important if you want to break them, because my purpose is to break them for a reason. And again, you as a photographer to understand why you have done that. So when you say, why is your horizon in the middle? You know, or, or, or why, why is the subject matter not on the third? You know, and you can be able to explain. And I think sometimes there's even need an explanation because someone can then watch that image and it can speak to them and they may not even know why. You know, but it's a strong composition that has drawn the viewer's eye into the image. So um, at the end of the day, the previous image I was on, the previous slide was a nice leading line to the subject matter. Um, I will show maybe some examples. Yes, so you can see this was shot in Memorial Park. Again, it's, it's a, a leading line to the statue. Again, you have the framing of the flamboyant trees and whatnot. I will give some examples of some compositions that I really love that I had before. Um, again, I'm talking about imagination and visualization. This is, to me, the most important thing for me. Before I go to anything, or I have a little list of things that I want to photograph. And for example, I want to photograph St. Charles Church. I've never done it before, but I want it to look a particular way. So if it, the things aren't there for me to create the image I have envisioned, I'm not going to do it because, you know, I guess it's a waste of time for me. I have a particular uh, way I would like it to, to look. I would like things to be arranged a certain way, and I will probably go to locations time and time and time again until I get it right. And if I don't, well, if it is near enough, I will probably then make that a final image. If not, probably I'll just end up somewhere on a hard drive or something. Um, you can advance that. So, again, excuse the garish colors here. For some reason, this is not how it's supposed to look. But, again, strong compositional elements for me. I have a fanaticism with lines and geometry, leading lines, the S curve, as you would hear photographers talk about, is a very um, pleasing piece of geometry and a piece very pleasing uh, compositional tool in imagery and uh, it gives uh, you know uh, uh, it leads the viewer's eye into the image and uh, so for example this uh, subtle escrow here of this little trail up in the in the plantation in the, in the hills in Parman you know so it'll lead the viewer's eye into the image and you the eye can wander around it's not too distracting while there are a lot of things going around here you also have a subtle uh, use of colors and, and homogeneous colors also in terms of standpoint, some things that I would look for. This was also shot after sun had set but there was a lot of color in the sky still. So you get that feeling of that twilight period, that dusk and when, how things can look. Um, again you have repeating patterns and you have leading lines, you have a subtle reflection, you have a, a, sub, a, a, a uh, um, st strong subject matter with this rock. This was shot in Moruga. This is actually one of my first images that I took a very long time ago when I first got a DSLR. And again, uh, through my journey in photography, I realized uh, why my focus needed to be on composition. So in this image, I've shared this because for me it was a, you know, I used the vehicles as a frame for this person. Again, another quintessential, maybe island scene where this gentleman is walking around the Queen's Park Savannah. You have the setting sun in the distance. And I've also shared this image because it's, uh, it, it shows you that sometimes too, uh, you, don't have, you don't have to be limited with a wide angle view. This is actually shot with a telephoto lens. And actually, it has become one of my favorite tools for landscape photography now. I have, you've been using my 70 to 200 more frequently than my wide angle lens. And you don't have to be limited to that traditional wide angle view. I think one of the main problems as photographers, landscape photographers, you get a wide angle lens and everything is wide. You know, but you need to be able to have the right subject matter for it and be able to use it correctly. So, um, again, as I mentioned, other techniques uh, apart from the composition and light and whatnot is the use of different perspectives. And also, um, you can experiment with playing with things like shutter speed, for example. So this was the use of a telephoto lens again. Again, I, I visualized this composition. This is very near to where I live. And I, have, I noticed over the years that the sun was set in a nice optimum position on this roadway. And I tried for three years to capture this image. But it only set, the sun only set here maybe once, maybe two, three times for the year in the optimum position. And every time I went to do it, the conditions never really materialized for me. 
Uh, this was the best attempt I ever had. Uh, to me, it was you know beautiful in terms of the light and whatnot. I did photograph this in different orientations, landscape, portrait, for example. And again, that is also very useful to you to be able to capture your scene in different ways, you know. And um, I think you know it, it's, 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 it helps you to be able to share your imagery in a different way for the same scene, you know. Again, this was a telephoto lens, as I mentioned. So this is another telephoto 72 to 200 millimeter lens used here. You don't have to be wide all the time. So that's the moral of the story. There is flexibility in terms of your equipment and what you can use to be able to capture that scene. You know, this is a very common scene. Everyone loves the Temple in the Sea. And um, I go there frequently also. When in doubt, I go to the Temple in the Sea. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's near to home and I could go there. What is going on here? Okay, so for example, perspective again. Use of a wide angle lens means sometimes you have to get in close to your subject matter. Also too, it means you put yourself and your equipment at risk. Apart from being shot, you can get your, your, your equipment wet. So I was, you could cycle through this chart. So I was uh, doing a seascape in Point Fortin uh, several years ago. This is what I wanted to achieve, that image there. But to get it, I had to get in close to this rock to get this subtle falling water over it. And uh, you know, again, I visualize this image from a seascape perspective as something I've always wanted. And various scenes, I like that dynamic motion in the water. I like that engaging feeling. It makes the view of you know wonder or what is going on in terms of the motion and whatnot. It doesn't have to be subtle, smooth water from a long exposure. You can have that. Again, playing with exposure and shutter speed is very good. But you know, you can get. You have to get into your scene to be able to use you know, the benefits and power of your wide angle lens. So shutter speed again, this is a different take on the temple in the sea. This is wide and uh, this was a three minute exposure and again you have to have the relevant tools to be able to, to capture such uh, imagery but again um, not all the time and long exposure is the, is the solution for everything. Um, I see photographers sometimes, everything, slap an ND filter on, let's expose this thing for four minutes and you just have silky smooth water and you know, sometimes what is the subject matter, what are you trying to convey to the, to the viewer. And for me, I love the subtle reflection on the water, these little tones, it was a beautiful sky and this was probably one of my favorite long exposures. Uh, this is another moderate long exposure. This is, was shot during daytime, shortly after sunrise. This is about two minutes long and a very challenging time to do long exposures because of the, the, the daytime light is bright. So you, you ideally you would like some dark time. Uh, 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 you don't want as much light to be able to get you know, a, a long enough shutter speed, but it is difficult to get a, a very long shutter speed during daytime. So, uh, sometimes you have to stack your filters and again your equipment here is probably very important and your technique again please excuse the images does should not look like this but you get the idea and the reason why I wanted to do a low exposure here is I wanted to isolate the fallen trees in the ocean because this area is subject to a lot of coastal erosion and it's just partly you know again what I see and what I do and there's a lot of coastal protection necessary now on this coast. You hear stories about the carcass, see just always different places. Our coastline has been eroded away. And this is a very good example. And I wanted to highlight the fallen trees and the uprooted tree stumps and whatnot. The coastline is receding. And this is the reason why I chose to do a long exposure, not just because it was, I felt bored, you know. So, and to me that's important, how you go about composing or, or, or executing your image to, to the viewer. So light is, again, the other thing that I find very important. I think the portrait photographers might like scenes like this. You want to do a nice little shoot here? Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do a nice little wedding. The, the light to me is beautiful. This is the, another example of golden hour with the, um, the traditional maraca scene here. You know, uh, I, I really love this. It was not a traditional landscape scene with the nice raging sunset sky and the fancy long exposure and whatnot. To me, it was the golden light at that hour, and you know the, how the gazebo just stood out, and the subtle wave action, and the mountains in the distance. This is also shot with a long lens to sort of isolate the subject. That's another little trick that you know photo landscape photographers like to use. You can get a compression because I guess a scene like this will be lost in a wide-angle lens, mm -hmm. and you know a lot of things are going on here that might not be visible. You know, you have a leading line, you have some sort of subtle framing with the trees. 
you have the, the, the scale with the mountains in the background, that will only be able to be achievable with a long lens. Again, uh, this is very unfortunate, it doesn't look like this in a calibrated monitor, but again, use of light with the repeating patterns of the trees in um, Manzanilla, and you have a leading line leading the viewer eye through the image along the roadway. You have those nice long shadows that I told you about. And uh, I think for this year, personally, a lot of my imagery was about using the light that I would encounter at those hours pre and post, um, post sunrise or pre sunset. So, you know, a lot of my images now have gradually progressed over time to, to sort of utilize this sort of uh, uh, light and scenery. Framing and light and also complementary colors are at play here. Again, this is an image, an old image I, I shot, and I, I purposely cropped it square because, and I show this image here because I feel cropping is a tool. A friend of mine is, she shuns on cropping. Oh my God, crop the image and whatnot. But to me, you can take a, an average image or, or, or mediocre image and make it more powerful by cropping it because at the end of the day, you may not have been able in the field to compose it the way you would have liked, and you can then now be able to frame it better. And for me here, the poetry framing, this other tree in the distance with the morning light coming from the right-hand side was, was what attracted me. And when I looked at it afterwards, it was a faux pas in the field. And if I went with it, it would have been a wasted you know, image. And I, I really liked it, the way it looked with the square crop and you know, the isolation of that little tree in the distance. As I progressed, I realized more and more that use of these various tools, the color, uh, the color, and light, and composition was most important to me, and I started to try to see my images if I could utilize more use of subtle color to, to engage the viewer. And in this image, I, this is an image I shot, it was an old image, and I we we'll mention this because I think uh, editing is your dark room. And the same way photographers of old would have done their various types of complex film processing is what we are able to do with all these various tools at our disposal. So I urge all photographers in general to perfect their craft when it comes to editing. And also that helps you not over edit things and create these garish images. And sometimes I guess it's good you could look back in the distance and see images you created before that will maybe ridiculously overdone. But here, basically in a nutshell, I try to utilize complementary colors again, and understanding the color wheel and how colors interact. You might want complementary colors, homogeneous colors, meaning a palette that is closer together. We might want colors that are opposing one another on a color wheel. Um, there are various ways that color can be used in composition and landscape photography. So, I just wanted to close with three of my all-time favorite images that I've ever taken. They speak to me personally. That's why they're my favorites. I probably have better, or the, you know. Uh, but for me, these three here. This one I shot. I submitted an image last year, which was successful, and I won the landscape photography category in a TTPS competition. This actually is shot on the same day. This is actually my personal favorite because to me, it embodied everything I visualized about last year, which is my favorite place in Trinidad. Um, it was a dreamy scene. I have light. I have color. I, I did tweak my colors a bit to try to please the viewer's eyes with subtle complementary colors and use of oranges and blue tones, which I hope they are not too overdone or too obvious. Maybe a year from now I look back at it and wonder what the hell I was thinking. I don't know, because that happens to me all the time. But for me, that was the embodiment of the perfect scene. I have a beautiful reflection, and I have my horizon on the, on, on somewhat in the center, because I wanted some symmetry. And I have the various the, the guard huts. I have a yacht, which you don't ever see a yacht in, in Las Cuevas, so you know. Uh, to me, a special image is one that's difficult to recreate, and I've never seen an image, a scene like this in Las Cuevas since. And I actually went here three days in a row until it, I, I got what I, what, I, what I wanted, or I got what the best it could have been. I went there, ironically, I just drive there from work every day uh, for those three days, and I was seeking a perfect landscape, a perfect seascape, it did not look good the first two days when I captured it. And I, this body of water remained there. The beach was flooded, it was spring tide, there was a lot of rain over that period of time. And you do see the effects of that with the clouds and whatnot moving and the sun setting over the distance. But again, repetition and being 
uh, uh, dedicated to getting your goal is maybe one of the underlying points I'd like to portray here. Um, this is probably one of my first sunset images that I liked, and that's when I was obsessed with the sky and whatnot. But I still love it, and though my style would have probably changed over time, I wanted to put, I wanted to, I, I've yet to recapture this feeling because it, for me it was a personal feeling when I was there. But so many things still remain true to me from this scene in terms of color, in terms of the blues and oranges, in terms of the compositions, in terms of the boats and the, 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 the feeling that I had when I photographed this. And lastly, this scene at Las Cuevas to me was a special one again. Um, I carried my wife here this evening. We were there literally almost alone. Um, we walked in the sand and when she, we, I was hunting for a composition around this rock. And when we, when we, she walked in the distance and then I saw the footsteps. Now naturally, the waves came and washed them over and I decided I will make some new footsteps of my own. <laughs> and at the end of the day, a friend of mine said, you know, sometimes you have to make an image. Now this is not Photoshop and it wasn't created, but I realized that I have the ability to do it in the field. I stepped in it, I walked around the frame and I ran back before waves could come over and sweep it over and I took my shot. Uh, I took several frames of it until I got what I wanted perfectly. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, the important thing is to visualize what you would like. And I saw the scene and I saw what needed to be there for me to be able to, to capture an engaging scene with many different elements here. You know, the footsteps also act like a bit of a leading line, leading the viewer's eye to the mountain and the setting sun in the distance. Again, play on colors and subject matter with the rock in the foreground and the distant mountains in the background. So I hope my presentation was somewhat informative. Anything. We'll just take a couple of questions so that we can have Maria and then we could come back again with more questions. Yeah, if anyone. What, what I, I just want to say one to yeah. Um Yeah, you mentioned quite a few times that you go back and you know, you're yeah. trying to. So, I mean, obviously, the image that you're trying to create is very clear in your mind yes. specifically. So, you're looking at specific things in terms of the composition, yes. the light. Yes, and those things. it's not proof. It's for me, yeah. it's, basically for me, I need to do the best I can to, 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 to present an image that I think is strong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't get it perfect, but I think if you if you aim for the stars, you land by the treetops kind of thing. And that is what I try to do. And to be able to achieve that, you know, my friends in work laugh at me because I, that's one thing. Um, three quick little things, I, I walk my camera everywhere I go. My camera goes with me everywhere. I mean literally. Grocery, I have my camera in my bag. I leave home, I go to work with two bags, my laptop bag, my camera bag. I go in the field on the boat, I have my camera with me. It is with me everywhere. My wife laughs, my <laughs> friends laugh. What do you do with these two bags? I work like a madman with these bags. And that's the only way you can be able to be in a position to capture these things. And I, if I finish work at a certain time, I run up to Las Cuevas quickly. Um, because I, you know, I, I mean like literally, sometimes Joel might laugh at me, boy, you should leave town since 3.30. So no, if I just go there and I run up quickly and I get what I want, I already have it visualized and I go and I try to achieve that, you know, and the only way to do that is to be able to be ready. Um, sometimes too, some of the best images are spontaneous. You might have something that might happen that you might not be able to plan for also. So I think, you know, I try to be ready for it and I have my gear with me at all times. Was there ever an image you did not take that you regretted not taking? All the time, all the time, all the time. When you see an image, take it. And I always, I say that and I fall fall of my own rule. You know, because sometimes you see something, you're driving on the road and then other times I pull aside. And some of these images I have uh, 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 are because, like, you know, like I was able to see something and I double back and I go. Or, and the other thing too is sometimes I go back days after and it's just never the same. You know, so it's kind of unfortunate and it's kind of interesting too because it shows you that, you know, like for example, that Escobar tie record, the black and white image that I shared here, I, I, I did not like it that much. It was a very strong composition for me and I wanted to do it again better. And I went back to tie record like three times and the river was never the same. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, like it goes to show you, do not miss an opportunity, however small it may seem, and take, oh, I'll come back and shoot that. And, and it'll probably never be there. That being said, have a little short list, you know, have things that you would like to capture in a certain way, mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to, you know, if, if you can, 
try to put things together in the scene that you know the way you envision it. Could be done in exhibition. I, I love sunsets. I think they're just I love all those sunset pictures. Oh my goodness. I'm sunset with my phone. Yeah. Best camera you have. Phone. And um but have you done ever done an exhibition? I thought of an exhibition is just get yeah. such a I, I, I would like to, I, I think, um, I'll be honest with you, one of, I had a lot of problems this year because I had so much goals and so much aims and tried to keep improving and do more photography and just keep going on the upward trend. Um, I had a small measure of success last year and I think I, you know, for me personally, and to be able to inspire me to do more work, better work, but life happens. Yeah. I had a newborn son in December, so that sort of like threw things out to the window, work is busy and you have to fit things around. Yeah. And yeah, you have so much things you would like to do. And you know, exhibition is one. Yes, so many things you you know you, you want to be able to capture and show and share. But the main thing is sharing work and enjoying what you do. And I think that's the fundamental thing. Whatever happens after that, it's a blessing. Yeah? Yes. And enjoying the DPS competitions. Yeah. So along those lines, where you see yourself for the next four or five years? That's a very good question, Daryl. Um, I I don't know to be honest with you. I would. And I, I, the first comment about it, if you could deliver it, photography, especially this kind of photography, is applicable to me because I have a very important job that I also love, and I need to ensure I, I'm able to continue to be able to do what I love to do, uh, but I, I have to do things I have to do. So I, I don't see myself being a full-time photographer, but I have to be able to have a balance and make things work in a way that I could continue doing what I like because it gives me great satisfaction personally. So to be honest, the necessary to get earnings from it or be, be able to be paid for it, for me, it's not that critical. For others, it will be. I have a friend who's a full-time photographer, and he started doing landscapes, but he had to shoot people because he has to pay the bills. But he still does what he likes in, in his spare time. All right? I keep a very t tight circle with these guys. There's Jason and Joel, and they're all admirable guys too, and very good landscape photographers also. But they, they are full-time, and they have to you know, make sacrifices and do what they have to do, just like I have to do what I have to do to be able to do this, you know? See, I love you, I a painter. No, no. I, I, I think yeah. maybe, I, I liked art and painting when I was in secondary school, but I didn't, um, I didn't get a chance to continue that. But it's something I would probably like because I think I, I should try to pursue different things in my spare time also to help me better my craft and be, be able to appreciate things better because I think painting is, I, I try to um, utilize the concept of the artist because Again, like I mentioned earlier on about creating a scene with an artistic view, uh, so sometimes I might have to move things around in the image, not not like grand things like you know, like for example, rubbish or if I have a light pole sticking up somewhere, I am removing it because that's not pleasing to the eye. But the painter has the opportunity to you know watch a piece of art. There's nothing there that's not supposed to be there. Everything there is for a reason. So I, I actually asked you that because of your. You have a huge love of color stuff. And yeah. How do you go to color? And, I just and it's something I need to improve on, to be honest. But I'm, I think that's also one of the important things. So I mm -hmm. know where your weaknesses are. So I look back at some of my images, and I will say this if you don't look back at your images and, and, and cringe, you're not doing something right. Mm -hmm. You yes. need to develop. And I look back and I say, what on earth was I thinking? You know, and that's terrible. And I look back at some of my work and and I might look back, not mine, I will look back at some of what I do now, many years, maybe even next year, and look back at this year's work and think it's crazy, you know, so. But, but painting, I think, is very beneficial for photographers on the whole, to be able to understand all the different elements. Yeah, and you think it's something to know, color theory and yeah. light and... Yeah, no, color, color to me, I, I, I went on a binge with color this year, and I think it's things I need to employ more, and I realize that you know, it's very important because color plays Sometimes an image is attractive to someone, they may not even know why, and it, it, it appeals to them. It's interesting. In the meantime, while we wait, um, we're going to start the next one. If you want to grab something quick to eat or drink, so then you could come back and sit. It's two minutes, just two minutes, Judge. Thanks for everyone's time. Yeah,